Yuan, we need to translate this into Japanese. No one here in Japan understands that an A-bomb actually saved Japanese and American lives. Well, great, translate it. You know, get, get some of the Japanese objectivists to translate it into Japanese and to, and to put it out there. But, look, uh, the morality of, of, um, of Hiroshima is not about saving Japanese lives. The morality of Hiroshima is about saving American lives. The job of the American government is to defend American lives. Now, it's true that in doing so, we also saved probably millions of Japanese lives. But that's just, a, that's just an added bonus. It's not what makes it moral. Morality is not about counting different body counts. It's about counting your body count. It's about winning by minimizing your own casualties. 75 years ago, 75 years ago, the United States dropped the first atomic bomb in human history on the city of Hiroshima in Japan. Somewhere between 60 to 100,000 people were dead almost instantaneously, although some of, much of that number, the number's uncertain, some of that number probably assumes the deaths of people in the days, weeks, months afterwards from the radiation who did not die instantaneously. A few days later, the United States dropped a second and indeed the last nuclear bomb to be dropped on Nagasaki, another Japanese city. A few days after that, the Japanese officially surrendered with no conditions and complete unconditional surrender of the Japanese, which brought about the end of World War II. Now, since that time, the dropping of the nuclear bombs, the dropping of the atomic bombs has been second guessed every single year, every single day. Today, one could argue it's not even second guessed anymore. Today, it is viewed as an atrocity, as a war crime, as a disaster, as horrific, as evil. There are demands that America, in a sense, take a knee, apologize for the horror that it had brought the world on those two days with the dropping of the atomic bomb. If you go through Twitter, and you look at the different comments about the, uh, about the 75th anniversary, almost all of them, almost all of them, are uh, depicted as one of the most horrific events ever, an event that we should be ashamed of, an event that the United States should apologize for, an event that we should remember for its horror. Indeed, many of the tweets are by the, the survive, some of the survivors, they're, they're getting pretty old now and they're not gonna be survivors soon, but people who as children lived through it and are telling stories about it and reminiscing about it. So, you know, if you look at Hiroshima, I mean, everywhere, look, by the way, the, the um, the numbers keep changing, you know, it's, it's hard to tell the exact numbers, but somewhere is between 60 to 100,000 uh, total deaths, probably closer to 100,000 if you count the people who died from the fallout in the months following the attack. So the question is, was this justified? Was the attack of Hiroshima, was the dropping of the nuclear war bombs the right thing to do? Should we use this day as a day of remembrance of the Japanese deaths? Or should we use this as a day of remembrance to remember the moral courage, I'd even say the heroism, of an American president, Harry Truman, who made the decision to drop those bombs? Was it the right thing to do? Was it the wrong thing to do? Was it the moral thing to do? 
Was it the militarily right thing to do? Or wasn't it? Now, as people encourage us to use this day to remember the hundreds of thousands of Japanese killed in Hiroshima, let me remind you of something else. That on the Pacific World War II, in a sense, or the Pacific War, didn't begin with the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, but began in 1931, when Japan occupied Manchuria, which is in northeast China, and then attacked China with an attempt to conquer it entirely. 1941, of course, Japan invaded Thailand, Malaysia, bombed the U.S. naval base in Pearl Harbor, which is in Hawaii, for those who are not sure. And, of course, Korea had been under Japanese occupation since 1910. Not to mention the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore, Burma, all to be occupied by the Japanese. Now, let me just cr give credit here. Um, whoops, why don't I have his name here? Let me just see. Article doesn't have a name. That's not good. All right, I'll get his name in a minute. I, I'm reading, I'm using part of my reference here. I've got a number of references. Part of my reference is an article that uh, a, an objectivist from Europe uh, send me. Uh, his name is Alex, um, which was a research project he did a few years ago on the dropping of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A a Alex Leibovici, who I think is Romanian. Yes. And it was published, essay was published in Romanian. I got a, a, a translated version in English. Um, but Japan, by this point, 1945, had been an imperialist power since 1910, had occupied all those countries, and had been savage and brutal in its occupation. I mean, the number of people that it had slaughtered in China, the rape and pillage that was committed, the massacres of civilians, are hard to imagine in the 21st century. By 1945, it's estimated there were 6 million military casualties as a result of the Pacific War, of which 2 million were Japanese. 2 million Japanese soldiers had died during the Pacific War that the Japanese initiated, that the Japanese launched. 25 million civilians, let me say that again, 25 million civilians had been killed of which one million were Japanese. So let's be clear, the Japanese killed 24 million civilians all over Asia, in China, Manchuria, Korea, Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, 24 million people. And we're not talking about the wounded, the maimed, which is usually three to four times those numbers. So somewhere around 100 million people, 100 million people were maimed, injured by the Japanese from 1931 to 1945. The Japanese had initiated violence throughout Asia, throughout the Pacific, and had launched a brutal attack against the United States of America in Pearl Harbor. They had declared war on the United States. And tens of thousands of American servicemen had already died. Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended that nightmare. Hiroshima and Nagasaki ended the nightmare that it resulted in 25, well, 31, if you had the soldiers, 31 million people dying. And maybe 100, 120 million people being maimed. Now, it's horrific to think of 80, 100,000 people dying in a day. 
But if we're going to remember anything, we should be remembering the victims of Japanese imperialism. We should be remember the victims of Japanese barbarism, of Japanese fascism. They're the ones who should be remembered. It is Japan who began the war. It is Japan that sought to conquer the entire Pacific. It is Japan that slaughtered people left and right. It is Japan that is morally responsible for every person who died during that war. So, do I mourn the people who died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Not really. Not really. Their death is a consequence of their own political leaders' efforts to conquer the Pacific. Efforts that led to the destruction and death on a massive scale, unprecedented scale. Scale only matched by the Germans in Europe in terms of numbers of human beings, numbers, the, the, the sheer quantity of life lost. So no. I think it's their victims who should be remembered. But you say many of the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were innocent. Sure, of course they were. Suddenly the children were. But the adults, were the adults planning to overthrow their own government, to stop the horror that they were inflicting on the world? Were the adults sabotaging their own production as to starve the war machine? so that they would stop slaughtering people all over the world? No. I'm sorry. But adults in any country are morally responsible for the actions of their government. It's why I think politics is important. It's because whether you like politics or not, they impact your life, and they speak for you, and they act on your behalf, and they represent you. And if they do something really, really bad, you suffer the consequences. The decisions made by politicians always fall, fall on the shoulders of the population. That's why it's the population's responsibility to fight bad decisions, to object to bad decisions, and to replace bad politicians, to penalize them when their mistakes are bad. This is always the case. Politicians don't pay the price. You pay the price. So no. The real horror of World War II is what the Germans and Japanese did in the world. The real horror of World War II is what fascism brought to the world. Not Hiroshima and Nagasaki that actually ended the nightmare, that actually stopped it all. Anonymous Doe asked, do you view Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor as unprovoked? The U.S. was aiding their enemy. From their perspective, it's cutting off a supplier. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a, a you know, fascinating question. Now, Ayn, Rand, Ayn Rand believed, I think, that it was provoked in the sense that the United States stopped providing the Japanese with steel and thus was, in a sense, helping Japanese, Japan's enemies or starving the Japanese from the raw material they needed in order to continue to engage in their war. And she believed that FDR probably knew an attack was coming on Pearl Harbor but ignored the warnings because he wanted it to happen because it was the way for him to get into the war and he wanted to go into the war. He wanted to get into the war particularly when it came to Europe. He wanted to go fight Germany. And the, the American public didn't want that. They, they, this was a period of American, what was called isolationism, but the idea was we wouldn't interfere in other people's wars. But, so he provoked the Japanese in order to attack Pearl Harbor 
So we could use that as an excuse to go to war with the Japanese and the Germans, primarily the Germans. So first, I don't know that that's true. It certainly could be true, and it certainly doesn't, I don't think that's a crazy idea. But it doesn't change the fact, it does not change the fact that Japan initiated war with the United States. Stopping trade, boycotting Japan, is not an act of war. Now, it is an act of determining that the other country is an enemy of yours. So I can understand why the Japanese were offended, right? But in, in and of itself, it is not the equivalent of bombing, killing, maiming. Now, notice what's interesting here. A lot of people say, you know, we provoked the Japanese to attack us by selling steel to them, uh, by not selling steel to them. And at the same time, they say, we should boycott China. We should raise tariffs on China. We should not sell stuff to China. Or we should not buy stuff from China. You can't have it both ways. Now, what's interesting to me is that Ayn Rand suggests that maybe it was okay to sell steel to Japan when Japan was a real threat to the United States and engaging in warfare and mass massacres and destruction all over Asia. And that was okay, then I, I suspect she would say it's okay to trade with China today. But the point here is it doesn't matter. Japan initiated war with China. Japan occupied Korea. Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Japan started a war. And therefore Japan, all the blood spilt in that war, every last drop of blood spilt in that war is on Japan. It's on their leaders, but it's also on their people. The people who agreed to fight for those leaders, the people who agreed to work for those leaders, the people who agreed to continue to function in a so-called civilized society for those leaders. It's their fault. And if they had to die to end it, so be it. Now, it's really interesting that people are so obsessed about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because in the months leading up to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United States firebombed, not used nuclear weapons, but just used bombs, firebombed Tokyo and every other major city in Japan, with the exception of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. By the time Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened, the United States had already killed well over 100,000 people from the air, just in Tokyo. They had turned a million people homeless, a million people homeless. They had destroyed. If you look at pictures of, of, of Tokyo, once the United States occupied, it was just flat. It was, there was almost nothing there. They were firebombed and crushed. So, Americans were already killing massive civ numbers of civilians in Japan. Again, justifiably. What difference does it make what kind of weapon you use to kill people? It's the killing that matters, right? All right, so some people said, say, you know, by that point, Japan had already lost the war. They weren't going to win the war. So why bother? Why do this? You know, you could have just kept on going and you would have defeated them. Well, at what cost? How many hundreds of thousands, how many hundreds of thousands of American kids would have died trying to occupy, fight on the shores of Japan? I mean, it's hard to imagine. Now, you could add in the Japanese casualties. You could add in uh, the Japanese civilians that would have died if the United States had fought on the beaches of Japan. You could easily argue, and this is not an exaggeration, that over a million people would have died. 
if the United States had actually invaded Japan in a conventional, in conventional attack. So what is better? To use a nuke, end the war by killing 140,000 people, let's say, or invade the country and land up having millions of people dead. It, it's just, just the math doesn't even add up. Not that I think the math matters. Because it's not about math. It's about principle. And that principle is, in my view, and I've written about this, you can find it in my article about just war theory. The principle is the United States government in fighting a war of self-defense, a war it didn't start, its sole responsibility, sole responsibility is to protect the lives of Americans. And it should fight a war to win it fast, cheap, and with as few American casualties as possible. And if that means using a nuke, then so be it. And so be it. And indeed, that's what happened in Japan. We won that war. And as I'll get to, we also won the peace. Where were all those Japanese people hating us, blowing themselves up to kill Americans as revenge? Why didn't that happen? Just to give you an illustration of the kind of casualties that would have been involved. In um, a few weeks before Hiroshima, um, an island of Iwo Jima that was defended by 21,000 Japanese. The United States suffered 7,000 dead, 20,000 wounded. You know, almost all the Japanese died. <laughs> now, to defend Japan, you would be facing at least 2 million Japanese soldiers. Huge quantities. Huge quantities of civilians. They would have all died, the Japanese soldiers you know, a significant number of the $2 million. It's just, it's just ridiculous. The whole thing is just ridiculous. The whole way of approaching this is ridiculous. If you can win a war fast, you win a war fast. If you can win a war by killing their population in order to save your troops, you kill their population. You kill their population. All right. Uh, Jennifer asked, do you think the relative peace the world has had since was a result of dropping the bomb? Yes, I do. I mean, one of the reasons Japan has become peaceful and has a fantastic constitution and has relative free markets is because of the, we dropped the bombs. And then once the, war, the, the world saw what drop, bombs could do, it was obvious that you didn't want to take on the United States. You didn't want to risk having bombs dropped on you. So I think that kept at bay the Russians. It makes the Chinese think twice about anything they might do. So any country is not going to go to war with the United States. I mean, the wars that the United States has engaged in since World War II have been wars that it chose to engage in by sending troops far away not wars that it had to fight, not wars of self-defense, wars that it got involved in for no reason. Korea, Vietnam, even I would argue the first Gulf War. And then when it did win, you know, fight wars, it has fought weakly, pathetically, lost, not used nukes, and he not used the might of the American military force at all. And as a consequence, what has happened? As a consequence, the United States has lost those wars. And as a consequence, the, United, the world has become, in many respects, less safe, not more safe. Because people don't fear the United States anymore. They don't worry about the United States anymore.
So invading Japan was really not an option. Some people say, oh, but, but, but the, the, the Russians had just entered the Pacific frontier and the Russians would have taken them out. Really? The Russians had just lost, I don't know, 20 million people in Europe. Their military was completely depleted. The only reason the Russians had a military was because it was supplied by the Americans. Imagine if the Russians indeed had sent in troops and occupied Japan. First of all, without any question, many more and more Japanese would have died than died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But secondly, Japan would have been communist. Is that a good outcome? You're now going to hire communists to fight your battles? It's bad enough, in my view, that we did that in Europe, that we allowed the Russians to fight our war, that we supported the Russians, that we promoted Stalin and handed all of Eastern Europe to him. So no, the idea that Russia was going to do it would be bizarre. Uh, there's a claim that we shouldn't have dropped the second bomb because by the first, they were about to surrender. There's actually very thin evidence about this. They were still, the Japanese were still debating it. But both the, uh, and while there were significant voices in Japan supporting surrender, the Japanese government itself was not unanimous after Hiroshima. While the civilians wanted to surrender, the military did not, and the emperor refused. Only after they saw it a second time, only the, after they saw the Americans' willingness to continue, even though they didn't know that we had no more bombs. I think there were only three bombs. The test bomb that we did in, in um, where was it, New Mexico, and the two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they didn't know there were no more. But they didn't take the risk. They didn't take the risk. It's only after the second bomb. They completely convinced the Japanese that they had no chance. No chance whatsoever. Remember, the thing, the effect of these nukes was not so much just to defeat the Japanese. It was to shock them into defeat. It was to shock them into submission. It was to shock them onto their knees. And being on their knees is really, really crucial for the peace that came afterwards. We'll get to that in a minute. You know, people argue, oh, we could have had peace talks. Well, peace talks would have just led to a ceasefire, which would have led to a rise in Japanese imperialism five years later because they would have thought, we never lost the war, we could still win, we can still do it, which is what happened, by the way, to Germany after World War I. It wasn't thoroughly smashed. It wasn't thoroughly defeated. It wasn't crushed and brought to their knees. So what happened? They waited for the opportunity to launch a second war, which is World War II. If we'd crushed them in World War I, not clear there would have been a World War II. Or if America had never entered World War I and we'd let it go on forever, maybe there never would have been a World War II. Some people talk about maybe the United States should have less stringent terms. But again, what led to the peace was the fact that the United States demanded and accepted and received unconditional surrender. So no, in my view, every year on the anniversary of Hiroshima, the Japanese government should send a letter to the United States people thanking us for dropping that bomb. It is that bomb not only that ended the war for the Japanese as well as for us, but that created modern Japan, that brought about the peace and stability and prosperity and wealth that Japanese society has created since then. Because what happened after the surrender? 
Well, what happened was that the Japanese gave up. They gave up all pretense. They gave up the idea that they would rule Asia. They gave up the sense of racial, cultural superiority. They gave up on those aspects of their culture. And what did they embrace? They embraced what, to a large extent, or to some extent at least, what the Americans left them with. So one of the interesting things about the American occupation of Japan is that as part of the occupation, a constitution was written, a new constitution that established the modern Japanese country, modern Japanese state. And who wrote that constitution? Well, not the Japanese. MacArthur had no patience for the Japanese constitution. He had no patience for a resurrection of the old Japanese system. So General MacArthur and one of his assistants sat down and they wrote the Japanese constitution. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that they did was that they ultimately didn't prosecute the emperor, which they were planning to do. And in exchange, the emperor endorsed the constitution. And this is a constitution that, for example, in the constitution it says that all individuals have inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In their constitution. They created a form of government. They created a system of government. They created a constitutional government that has led to incredible prosperity and peace in Asia, and particularly in Japan. So, the Japanese are far, far better off for having ended the, war, ended the war quickly, I mean quickly, 1945 is late, having not had to fight on Japanese soil, for ending it with a shock to the system so that they were open to accepting a constitution that MacArthur basically forced on them. And the Japanese don't hate us because the realization that the Japanese came to was that they were wrong. They were wrong. They had engaged in activities that were unjustified. They shouldn't have launched a war. That they shouldn't have done what they did. They swore never to do it again. And that kind of educational benefit, if you will, sometimes you need a shock to the system to get that. Sometimes you need, not sometimes, always you need to thoroughly defeat your enemies if you're going to, if you're going to establish that. Um, all right, so what are kind of the lessons for today? Well, the lessons for today, I mean, I've written about extensively. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, Winning an Unwinnable War, edited by Ilan Jono, where I have three essays. And in those essays, I articulate the case for fighting the war against Islamism, which was post-9-11, which was the war that America needed to fight properly, which means brutally, which means to crush the enemy, to bring them to their knees. The only way Islam will go away is if it is defeated thoroughly, unequivocally. It's only when they know they cannot win will they change their ways. And we could do that easily and quickly and thoroughly. And we still might have to because Islamism is not gone. Iran is still there. Hezbollah is still there. Iraq and Syria are still areas in which Terrorists, jihadis are being trained, sponsored, supported. We will have to fight another day. But the only way, the only way <laughs> to fight is to win. And to win so thoroughly that the enemy has to question their beliefs. That's what happened in Japan. That's what needs to happen in the Middle East. Indeed, 
It's the only way you can end the threat of Islamism. And, and for those of you, and I know there are many of you, who are skeptical, oh, Islam is always going to be evil. Islam is always going to send terrorists. It's not, you, know, you, you can't defeat them over there. You have to build walls and protect yourself from the evil Muslims. Look how many terrorist attacks there have been since ISIS has been defeated. It wasn't even that thorough. It wasn't even that brutal. It wasn't even that systematic. And yet, look. People don't strap on bombs. Don't commit suicide. Not in large numbers. For a losing cause. Make Islamism a losing cause. Just like there are no Japanese suicide bombers today. There'll be no Islamic suicide bombers if you make their cause a losing one. And if they know with confidence that you will make their cause a losing cause. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want, to see, I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. It, all it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes but uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share, and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support, or on Patreon, or Subscribestar, or Locals, uh, and, uh, and show your support for, all, for, for, for the work, for the value, hopefully, you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if you... Even if you just come here to troll, or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe, because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified. Right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.